Well, hey, we are going to jump back into uh, the book of Romans this morning. No amens? Come on, I was waiting for an amen. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> now, we're going to finish the book uh, by God's grace. Not, not today, um, of course, but over the next uh, few months. And, um, you know, today we're going to cover uh, one verse, actually. And, be, and part of the reason for that is we're going to do a little bit of a review um, before we get um, into the verse, because we've been out of the book of Romans for a little while. We want to kind of build up a, a running start, if you will, to, to twelve one. try to put it in context and, um, and then just, just sit and, and enjoy one of the most beloved verses um, that we find in the Bible, okay? And so that's, that's really the goal this morning. We just want to sit and enjoy the Word of God. You know, you can enjoy the Word of God. It doesn't have to be burdensome to look through it. It's, it's very exciting to see what God has done for us. And so um, the title of the message this morning is, This is Reasonable. Or you want to say, This Makes Sense. You can say it that way too. And we'll kind of talk about why, what's reasonable, what makes sense as we go. But let's do a quick review of the book of Romans. And, and quick is the operative word because we've spent a lot of time going over a lot of things. But remember, when we look at the book of Romans, the, the major theme or the main theme of the book is righteousness. And we can summarize it really quickly in, in, in this way. God requires perfect righteousness. We don't have it, but God provided what we don't have through the gospel. That's really the message of the book. That's the main theme of the book. In fact, religion teaches opposite of this. Uh, they might say, they, religion would say, God doesn't require perfect righteousness. He just requires your best. God doesn't require perfect obedience to the Ten Commandments. He just requires you trying. And that's, that's how many people describe how they're going to get to heaven. Well, I'm, I just, I'm trying to keep the Ten Commandments. I'm trying to do the best that I can. And so they would take that first statement up there that God requires perfect righteousness and says, no, 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 God grades on the curve. As long as you try your best. Well, what we found out in the book of Romans, God doesn't grade on the curve. God grades it exactly the way it's got to be graded. He's a perfect judge. He will punish lawbreakers. The moment you break the law, you're a lawbreaker deserving of the penalty of sin, which is, which is death. We learned that in the book of Romans. We, we learned really clearly through the first three chapters that we're all on this big highway to hell, right? And it doesn't matter if we change lanes on that highway. We can be an immoral sinner. We can be a moral sinner. We can be a religious sinner. The, the same highway leads to hell. We need to take the exit that's been provided for us in the gospel where God provides the righteousness needed to get to heaven. The perfect righteousness that you and I can't achieve, he's provided in the Lord Jesus Christ who died for your sins and rose again. He paid the penalty for your sins, the very penalty that you and I deserved, but you're also credited with his righteousness the moment you put your faith in him. And so that is the good news of the book in Romans. In fact, we find out that in the first eight chapters that God has a salvation plan a package, a, a benefits program. Have, have you ever signed up and started a job that you didn't realize how good the benefits were until after you got there? I've, I've had friends where they were just looking for a job. They just needed a paycheck. And so they ended up stumbling into a job, they thought. And then they began to find out what the benefits were as part of that package, the 401k plan, the medical insurance, and they begin to say, wow, this is incredible. Well, God's salvation package is just like that. See, sometimes when you get saved, you put your faith in Christ, you think, well, um, I, I'm getting a free ticket to heaven. I get a, you know, I'm saved out of the, the penalty of sin. I don't have to go to hell. But we don't realize is that God's salvation package is much greater than that. It's full and complete. God didn't just do things halfway he took it all the way. And so what we learned in the first eight chapters of the book of Romans is that God's salvation package comes in three tenses or three phases. The first tense, big theological word, justification. And what justification tells us is that we have been saved. It's a past tense from the penalty of sin, the moment we put our faith in Jesus Christ and his finished work for us. The reason God can say you have been saved, it's a done deal, past tense, is because once the penalty has been paid, there's no penalty that remains. And when Jesus died on the cross, the very last words he said before he took his last breath was, it is finished, paid in full. He took care of the penalty of sin. He paid it in full. And that's why God, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, can declare you righteous. 
He can say that you're saved, past tense. And so we can speak of our salvation from the penalty of sin as a past tense event. We are saved. 100% sure we know we're going to heaven because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. And so justification, as it relates to the word righteousness, is when God declares you righteous. And we find that out in the first five chapters of the book of Romans, that he does that when you put your faith in Jesus Christ. There's more good news as part of that salvation package because not only are we declared righteous, but in sanctification, which we learned about in Romans 5, 12 through about 8, 17, uh, we learn that we are being saved, present tense, from the power of sin um, each moment as we walk by faith in Jesus Christ and his finished work. Now, what we learned in Romans 6 is there's a different aspect of the finished work of Christ that doesn't get emphasized a lot. We always hear about Jesus dying for our sins, rising again for us. But in Romans 6, we find out that God identified you and I with Jesus Christ and we died with him. See, there's a, there's a second aspect to the finished work of Christ that doesn't get emphasized a lot. And this is the key to being delivered from the power of sin because we've been crucified with Christ. We've been raised to newness of life in Christ. And now every moment of our Christian life should be spent reckoning those truths to be, uh, to, to be true and then presenting our bodies to the Lord by faith. That's what we read about and that's what we studied in Romans 6, 7 and part of 8. And so as the first tense of our salvation, God declared us righteous. The second tense of our salvation, God is making us righteous. He's, he's fleshing out. He desires to flesh out righteous living in our lives as believers. And he's put everything in place so that you can be successful in that endeavor. And that's what we looked, about, looked at in Romans 5, 12 through Romans 8, 17. And then finally, that third tense of our one salvation is glorification. This is in the future tense. We will be saved from the very presence of sin. And I look forward to that day. I look forward to the day where I can be delivered from myself, in a sense, and all the failures and all the mistakes and all the sins that I commit. And I look forward to the day where I have unbroken fellowship with the one who died for me and rose again. Don't you look forward to that day too? That's a glorious day. That's part of our salvation package. We're delivered from the very presence of sin, but that doesn't happen until we die or we're raptured. That's when that happens, but that has also been secured for us. And I would call that righteousness realized. Finally, our condition, the way that we live, our practical, uh, the way that we move is gonna match up with our great position that we have in Christ. Righteous, holy, blameless in his sight. One day it's gonna match with our actual walk. And that's a glorification. So that's the first eight chapters of the book of Romans. But then we get to chapters nine through 11 and it's, there's like an elephant that's taken residence in the corner of the room. And the elephant is basically, well, wait a minute. If God is doing all these special things for the church, what happened to his nation, Israel? Did he just give up on his nation? I mean, what about all these promises we find in the Old Testament? What is God doing with Israel? So we spend Romans 9, 10, and 11 looking at what God's plan was for the nation of Israel. In fact, that section unfolded to us what, the, what God's plan was relative to us, the church, but also what's his plan for, for national Israel. And so in Romans 9, we review God's past dealings with the nation. We looked at how God dealt with the nation in the past. Romans 10 discusses God's present dealings with the nation of Israel. And then Romans 11 discussed God's future plans for the nation of Israel. And so that brings us up to speed with where we're going now, Romans 12. And I want you to notice in Romans 12, 1, that the very first word, or depending on your translation, um, is it, one of the first words, let's put it that way, is, is therefore. I beseech you, Therefore. And as they, they teach you in seminary and they teach you in any kind of Bible study class, you need to find out what the therefore is there for, right? And that's, that's what they always say and it helps you remember that it's tying something, it's dragging something with it. Um, and that's what we want to look at. And so in Romans 12, what we're going to find is if we could put the, the book of Romans together in linear fashion, what we would find is that we could technically jump from Romans 8.39 to Romans 12.1. That's the flow of thought in the book. Romans 9, 10, and 11, it's like, um, and this won't be an English lesson, so just relax. I'm going to start mentioning some English terms, but like in an English sentence, you're reading something and something's in a parentheses. 
Typically, it provides extra information, but you could read it straight through without looking at the parentheses. And so that's kind of what Romans 9, 10, and 11 is. It's a, it's a sidebar. It's a quick explanation of why this pink elephant appears to be in the back corner of the room, just sitting there. That's kind of odd. And he explains what God's plan was for the nation of Israel. And so as we jump from Romans 8.39, the elation of 8.39, he says, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus the Lord. And then we move to Romans 12.1. But before we do, let me give you a quote. This is, this is so important because as we get into Romans 12 through 16, many people will say, this is the practical portion of the book. And part of me, I know what they're saying, and I kind of agree with that, but part of me doesn't like that phrase because what does it imply? It just implies everything we've looked at hasn't been practical, right? It implies that y'all could have just stayed home the last two years and just showed up for today, right? That's, that's kind of what that statement implies, although I don't think people mean it when they say that. But let's, let's talk about how this fits together. And so Kenneth Wiest, who is a, a Greek scholar, I think says it very succinctly, he says this, doctrine must always precede exhortation, since in doctrine the saint is shown his exalted position, which makes the exhortation to a holy life a reasonable one. And in doctrine, the saint is informed as to the resources of grace he possesses with which to obey the exhortations. Now, that's actually in English. That's just kind of a proper way of saying it. What is he basically saying? What we learn in doctrine is going to give us the resources we need to live out the practical exhortations in the Christian life. And see, what we're going to find in Romans 12 through 16 is largely instruction on Christian conduct and Christian behavior. But if we don't rely on the resources of doctrine that we've learned in the first eight chapters, guess what Romans 12 through 16 can turn into you? A legalistic mess of a nightmare trying to live the Christian life. Because living the Christian life, we must depend on the Christian resources that we find in Jesus Christ. That's what we have to know about. And so we're taking those things that we've learned and now we're putting it into shoe leather, right? We're taking the practical doctrine. You ever heard those two words used together? But it is, it's practical. Because how else do you know where your freedom from sin's power is if you don't understand Romans 6? How else do you know how to obtain freedom from sin's power if you don't understand the command found in Romans 6, 11, which tells us to reckon ourselves dead to sin and alive unto God. And we're not reckoning it to make it true. It's already true. We're just writing it down and counting on it because that's where our freedom from sin's power comes from. It was accomplished by a work of God through Jesus Christ and identifying you with him and his death in resurrection. See, these are things that we need to know to live out the practical behavior, conduct commands that we're going to find in this section of Romans. And see, in order to behave righteously, you've got to understand, I've got to understand and utilize God's resources that have been provided to us. If we don't know about those, all we're going to do is take Romans 12 through 16. It's just going to turn into a legalistic checklist. And guess what? We're going to find ourselves in the failure of Romans 7. The things I want to do, I can't do. The things I don't want to do, I keep doing. And we're going to run on this cycle, this vicious hamster wheel of Christian life. And that's not how it's designed to work. It's designed to work in full benefit of God's resources and the salvation that he's provided for you in Jesus Christ. He didn't just save you from the penalty of sin. He wants to save you from the power of sin in our daily lives. And he's provided the means for that. And so as we get into verse one, we see that this therefore is dragging something with it. And so what is, uh, what does verse one say? Well, he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And so therefore indicates that he's building off of what came before. And so the question becomes, is he just talking about the last few verses in chapter 11? Is he just talking about chapters nine through 11? Or is he talking about the whole book? We're gonna make the argument that he's talking about the whole book. And the reason we're gonna make that argument is because the word mercies is in the plural. Okay, and we'll kind of build on that. Um, here in a second, but we're going to make the argument that based on the mercies that we've read about and studied in Romans 1 through 11, 
He, he has an exhortation for us based on those. So therefore, based on that, that's what we're dragging along. He's gonna use this word beseech. I think some of your versions may say urge. And so this word beseech means to aid, to help, to comfort, or to encourage. In fact, Paul had a choice here of Greek words. He could have used uh, another word that meant something similarly, but this word that he uses here has a more intense flavor to it, okay? In fact, it's, it's intense in the sense that it, it was often translated plead or beg or implore or urge. It's not just asking a request, but it's asking a request in such a way that you hope people respond to it. You, you want people to respond to it. In fact, um, this word uh, has an intensity to it and an immediacy because it's given in the present tense in the Greek. The idea is do this right now. Please respond to this right now. Please take advantage of this right now. That's the idea that we see here. And not only that, but in the Greek language, Paul puts the word first in the Greek sentence, which gives it even more emphasis. You know, Greek is different that way from English. We typically do subject, predicate, object. Well, Greeks could shift their words all around. They want for emphasis. And so sometimes they put the verb up front. Sometimes they'll put the direct object up front. Sometimes they'll put the subject up front like we. But in this case, this word beseech or or urge is the one that's jammed up front for emphasis. But one of the things I want you to take a special note of is this. This is not a command. Okay? This is not a command. It, It has that flavor in the English, I beseech you, I urge you. It, it kind of has that, in, and there's an intensity to it, but it's, it's not a command. It's, so it's not Paul cajoling or manipulating somebody into doing something. Um, he could have commanded. He has the right to command, but understand this. He doesn't command because this is the language of grace. Commands are the language of law. He, he takes the position of grace. He wants them to respond to the urging. He doesn't want to command them and force them to do that. Now, now, why is that so important? Well, part of the reason it's so important is because now he's appealing to the persuasiveness of the truth of what God has done for you. See, he's taking us back as believers to focus and occupy ourselves with the things that God has done for us in hopes that we respond to that by faith. And what he's going to, what we're going to see in verse 1 is it's faith presentation. It's presenting your bodies. He, he's hoping that these truths that we reflect on will lead to a response of faith in presentation of our bodies. Now, one of the things that you'll see is it, it wasn't a command. And I think the reason it's not a command is because attitude is essential here. Motivation is essential here because if you're just going through the motions because the apostle told you to do it, you have this, this potential to just do it and go through it with the poor attitude without the proper mental reflection on the truths that he wants them to reflect on. And so he doesn't command them here. I like what, what one commentator said. He says, beseeching here lies between commanding and urging. Probably Paul did not command his readers because the attitude with which one presents himself or herself to God is crucial. The apostles did not want his readers to comply because he had commanded them to do so, because they, but because they wanted to because of what God had done for them. And you see that occupation with the mercies of God as being the motivator. Now, why does he, um, well, let's, let's look first of all, and he gives this exhortation you'll see in verse one to brethren. I beseech you therefore, brethren. He's talking about believers here and he's pleading with, with them on the basis of something. And we're going to see from the verse that the basis of what he's pleading with them is the mercies of God. And so he is going to take, I believe, the most powerful, motivating, moral effect or factor that the world has ever seen. He's going to take what God has done for them and put that forth as the motivation to serve the Lord, to walk with the Lord. See, it's all based on what God has done. It's the mercies of God that we're looking at. And so he says... By the mercies of God. Well, the mercies, uh, mercies, the word itself is plural, as we stated earlier, but it, it just means pity or compassion. It means pity or compassion, which one shows for the suffering of others. Now, how did God show us mercy? Well, as we've seen so far in the book of Romans, the entire book has detailed this plan of salvation or deliverance that God put in place for helpless sinners. 
You know, one of the things that's um, interesting is, is I've talked to people over the years and say, uh, who have told me they've gotten saved. I, I'll ask a question many times that flushes that out. And I say, well, when did you realize that you were a helpless sinner deserving of hell? And they'll say, oh, I, I've never, what are you talking about? I'm a good person. You know, but this is, this is the understanding that the book of Romans gives us. Not that God is saving good people because he doesn't save good people. He saves sinners. He doesn't save godly people. He saves ungodly people. In fact, Romans 5 tells us that Christ died for us while we were still ungodly. And see, religion wants to push us up and elevate us up as good people where the book of Romans and the word of God says, no, 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 you're not good enough, but hold on. God has made provision for you to give you the righteousness that you need to get to heaven. And see, we were helpless sinners. In fact, if we got what we deserved, we would deserve death and hell. And yet, by God's mercies, him showing pity and compassion for, for, for the suffering of others, for this helpless state that we're in, he took matters into his own hands and he provided the solution for our sin problem. That happened through the gospel. He has devised a way, he's communicated a way for sinful persons deserving of death to be made right in his sight. And not only that, but to live a practically holy life that would be pleasing to him and then to live forever in his presence, completely free from the presence of sin. God has done all of this. How did he do it? Well, we know that he did it through his salvation package. He did it through the gospel of Jesus Christ and he's provided it for both Jew and Gentile. And so Paul right here is passionately, if you wanna say it that way, pleading with the Roman believers to do something now he's, he's exhorting them to do something in light of what God has already done for them. You see the connection between doctrine and exhortation. It's not just do things to do things, but it's do things in light of what God has already done for us. It's do things resting and relying upon God's resources and what he's put in place for us. And so he's passionately telling them that this is what he's doing. He's urging them. He's beseeching them. Notice too, before we move on from this word, that Paul is not beseeching them by the wrath of God. You better do this or else. <laughs> That's not the motivation. That's not the exhortation. He's not beseeching them uh, because of fat, past failures. He's not beseeching them because of God's future judgment. And they might, they might get it in the end if they don't behave in the right way. That's not the motivation. That's not why he's beseeching them. That's not uh, the, the motivating factor that he's giving them. What is the motivating factor? It's the love of God. It's the mercies of God. It's everything that God has put in place for them. That alone is the greatest motivating factor when understood that could ever be given to anybody. You know, there are many pastors around the world, and we meet many of them in Liberia, who, who believe that you have to um, threaten people with the fires of hell to get them to behave in the present. You know what? That is the wrong motivation. Fear is a is a garbage motivation for anything that would be stable or consistent. Because if I can get you to fear and behave while I'm here, what happens when I leave? Well, when the cat's away, the mice will play, right? As they say. And so it's never about a leader manipulating you into proper behavior or a society manipulating you into proper behavior when it comes to Christianity. We're talking about if we can't present to you in such a clear manner the mercies of God, if that can't motivate you, nothing will. Nothing will motivate you. Nothing will be consistent. Nothing will be stable. It, you'll, be, you'll ride the wave of roller coaster all your life. And that's why Paul, in his, in his strongest, passionate way, says, I beseech you, I urge you, I beg of you, I plead to you. By the mercies of God, you need to look back, constantly look back to what God has done for you. And so this is the motivating factor that he he, he puts forth. Remember, it's always God's goodness that moves us. 2 Corinthians 5.14, it's the love of Christ that constrains us, that compels us to move forward and to live a life that's worthy uh, and glorifying to him. And so what is Paul pleading for? What is, based on the mercies of God, what is the exhortation to do? Well, look at verse one again. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that next phrase, that you present your bodies. And we'll come back to those descriptions here in a second. But he says, present your bodies. 
a, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable, a holy, acceptable, and living sacrifice. This word pre- present should take us back to Romans 6. That's where I believe Paul is pulling this idea from. And so just flip quickly with me to Romans chapter 6, and let's just read verse 13. And here's what we've got to understand. You know, this therefore tying stuff together, what is he tying it back to? Well, when we talk about presenting our bodies as living sacrifices, we have to present with accurate knowledge. This is not just presenting our bodies, presenting our bodies, presenting our bodies with, with no accurate knowledge. And many people just want to fast forward the book of Romans to Romans 12 and then just work with it from there. No, it's, it's tying us back to something. And what we have to understand is what it's tying us back to. And let's just look at one verse, um, Romans 6. Um, actually, you know what? Let's look at three verses. Romans 6, 11. Let's start there. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That word reckon is an accounting term. It means you write it down. You start to count on it. It's a faith word. And what are you counting upon? Well, you're counting on the fact that you are dead to sin, the source, the sin nature, but you're alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, based on that, Based on what you know that you've been crucified with Christ, that's what Romans 6, 6 tells us. Based on what you know that you've been raised to newness of life with Christ, that's what Romans 6 teaches us. We're to count on that and then go on to verse 12. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lust. Verse 13, here's our word present. And do not present, it's a present tense verb there. Do not go on presenting your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin or the sin nature, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. So how are we to present ourselves to God? As those who are alive from the dead. What does that mean? That's resurrection life. That's that's life from the dead. That's a living sacrifice. And so when we get to Romans 12, 1, understand this, that the word present is based on the finished work of Jesus Christ and taking you and I with him into his death and into his resurrection. It's all based there by faith in Romans chapter six. That is how we walk by faith. That's the object of truth that we rest upon to live the Christian life. That's it. And so it's not just present your bodies. I mean, many people will say, well, this is consecration. I'm just gonna give my life to the Lord. That's not what we're talking about here. It's a very mindful presentation. The mindfulness is the fact that God took us into the death of Jesus Christ with him, took us into his resurrection with him. That's the key to being freed from sin's power. And that's the key to uh, a faithful and accurate presenting of our bodies. And so this word um, present, if we can define it, simply means this. It's a very simple word. We don't want to complicate it. It means to cause to stand near or before, or to place something nearby, or set before someone or something. It, it, the idea is that you're standing near. You know, um, let's, uh, let's go to the, to the next point. It was used in the sense of placing something at hand in a position ready for use, okay? Um, you could say that this podium, this pulpit right here, was presented for me. It was, it was placed near. It wasn't over there. I didn't have to go grab it and bring it over here. It was placed near. So when I came up here, I was able to put my, my, my Bible and my notes down to teach this morning. It was presented. This was also presented to me. This is how I move the PowerPoint. It's placed near. If it was back in the sound room, and I imagine if I had to walk back there every time to fast, you know, bring forth a point. So this is what we're talking about, presenting. And we are to present our bodies or place our bodies near to God for his good pleasure and use. To take the, the members of our bodies, as, as Romans 6 tells us, the instruments of righteousness, and place them near to God for his good pleasure and use. Now, what's the alternative? Well, Romans 6.13 told us the alternative. We can present ourselves near to the Lord, or we can come over here and we can present ourselves and place ourselves near to the sin nature. And unfortunately, many times in life, our default mode is exactly this. The sin nature tells us to do something, right here for service. I'm right, I'm right here for service, yep. You want me to get angry? Sure. You want me to say an unkind word? Sure, boom, fly it out. 
and we present ourselves for service to sin. And, and what you have to realize and what I have to realize as a believer is that automatic domination, that automatic connection that existed before you got saved no longer exists. It's been severed. And now you have for the first time a choice. You can present yourself to God or you can present yourself to sin. That's the choice you have as a believer. You've been freed from sin. It no longer has automatic domination of you. You know, when you think about um, uh, a servant, you know, think about uh, if you've ever been to a fancy restaurant or you've ever been in a restaurant in general where there's a good waiter or waitress, and one of the things that they're really good at is, is they stand near and they keep an eye on what you need. They're always watching your hands. And so the second you slurp up your Coke and, and, and it hits the ice and it's not hitting drink anymore and the, the drink's getting low, what does a good waitress or a good waiter do? They're right there with the next drink. They're, they're keeping an eye on their master. You know, they're not thinking about what they want to do. They're only attentive to what the master needs. They're, they're right there available. And you know what? If I need an extra Coke, if I need more ketchup, if I need more French fries, if I need salt, I, I need anything, they don't care what it is. They're just attentive and there for those needs. They're not dictating to me what kind of drink I'm going to get the next time around. They're not, well, I like Sprite, so here's your Sprite. No, they said, what do you want? <laughs> I want Coke. I don't like Sprite. Okay, well, we're going to bring you Coke then. And I want a hamburger. Don't give me that broccoli, you know, garbage. Don't give me that salad. Bring me the hamburger, you know. Um, my wife's saying, no, bring him the salad, you know. But uh, no, give me the hamburger. And so the waiter or wait staff, they're, they're there presenting themselves near. They're keeping an eye on what you need. That's the idea communicated here as we present our bodies. Now, one of the things we want to talk about, because many times as this is taught, many people will say, well, it's, it's an aorist tense. This word present is the aorist tense, which is a point in time action in the Greek. But many have taught that this is a one-time consecration or a one-time commitment in the believer's life. They'll say, well, yeah, you just got to do this once, and then it takes effect. And um, so that's just kind of a misuse of, of the Greek word. And so let me, or the Greek tense. And so let me just get, kind of briefly talk about this because in Romans 6, what we find is that Paul actually fluctuates back and forth between um, the present and aorist tenses when it comes to this word, okay? In other words, a, a continual action or a one-time um, point in time event. And so I don't think he's talking here about a one-time consecration. You know, that, that's what many people will say. Well, yeah, I went, I was at a meeting and, and they said, whoever wants to serve the Lord, come forward. And man, I consecrated myself to the Lord that day. And they, they'll go back to an event. This is not what I don't believe Paul is talking about here. Paul is talking about um, a point in time. Um, let's, let's just read this. It's a point uh, being made that it's at a moment in time, you and I have to volitionally, that means make a decision, we have to choose by faith to present our bodies to the Lord. And this is something that needs to be done over and over again in every situation that we're in. So we might do it 10 times one day. We might do it 100 times one day. We might do it 1,000 times one day. This is a mental active, volitional decision to say, I am going to present my body to the Lord as one alive from the dead. I'm going to reckon my son, I'm counting on my death with Christ to sin, my resurrection with Christ and newness of life, and I am going to present my body as one alive from the dead to you, Lord. That means my hands, that means my lips, that means my mouth, that means my feet, that means my body, my instrument that God wants to live in and through me to impact those that I interact with on a daily basis. And that's what we're talking about here. This is every situation that we're in. And so if you are living your Christian life and the word present doesn't even come into your thinking, what are you doing? What do we... What are we doing if this isn't in our thinking? If we're, not, if we're not even thinking this way, what are we doing in our Christian life? We're just wandering around? We're just lollygagging around life? Just sucking up oxygen? I mean, is that, is that really what we want our Christian life to be about? Or do we want to be presented instruments of righteousness? Is that what we want? I mean, I would think that every believer in this room says, yeah, that's what I want. That's what I want for my life. That's what I want my life to be about. And yet many times we just float around life. Anything but this is on our mind. See, we, and I, and I use the word we for a reason because I'm talking to myself here. 
we need to do this more consistently. This needs to be the way that we think. See, we don't, we don't think this way. We think about getting our circumstances more comfortable. We think about getting our life in order. We, we think about shielding ourselves from bad. So all we're interested in many days of our life, if we're honest with ourselves, is easy circumstances, sweet tea, lawn chair, and a book, right? For some of us that like to read. And that's how we view the Christian life. This this is why Paul is saying, please, I'm begging of you. I'm begging of you by the mercies of God, present your bodies. And the last time I looked, everyone in this room has a body. So you have what you need to please the Lord, right, right there, attached to your bones, <laughs> you know, encompassing your soul, your spirit, your mind. You have exactly what you need. It doesn't matter if it's broken down. It doesn't matter if it's old. It doesn't matter if it's young. It doesn't matter if it's disease-ridden. It doesn't matter. You have a body as you sit there today. God can use you. God wants to use you. When we start to present our bodies to him, this active voice is used for this verb. It's used indicating that you have to intentionally choose to make your body available to the Lord by faith. See, if you're not actively engaged in this manner of thinking, I will tell you who you're presenting yourself to, sin. That's default. That's going to be the default mode for every Christian is we're going to present ourselves to sin. If you're not actively engaged, that's why it's an active voice. We've got to make this choice. This has got to be part of our thinking on a daily basis. And this is why Paul beseeches you, begs you, pleads with you and me. This has to be part of our life. This has to be part of our thinking. And then he goes on to describe it as a sacrifice. And I put it as a question mark, a sacrifice? Well, how can it be living if it's, you know, I mean, and so he's using some word pictures here. Present your bodies as a sacrifice. So he goes on to, to, to describe this presentation as a sacrifice. The imagery that's given is really interesting because when, when they would put sacrifices on the altar, um, they would tie it up so it couldn't move. That, that's really, I think, the, the image that we get because once it, the sacrifice was on the altar, it belonged to God. It was, it was God's sacrifice. They couldn't say, oh, you know what? Man, I found a lamb. Can I take that one back? I found a lamb that's got like a little nick. I'd like to just switch that out. You know, can I just exchange that one? No. The second it went up on the altar, it was tied down. It was, it was God's. They couldn't get it back, right? And the idea is that once the sacrifice is on the altar, it belonged to God. And so when we, when we tie this over to what Paul is saying, I believe it's this. It's a recognition that we lose control the moment we present our bodies. Lose control in the sense of what we determine, what we are going to do with our life. And you know, that's a good thing. That's a scary thing because most of us like to have our hands on the wheel. You know, like Carrie Underwood's old song, Jesus, Take the Wheel. Most of us are like, Jesus, slide over. I got the wheel, right? I'm going to take the wheel. We don't want to relinquish control of anything. We want to we wanna grip it tight and control it even more. When things start spinning out of control, we just white knuckle driving. You know, you just want to grab that wheel. But the point is this. The moment we present our bodies to the Lord, we lose control. We lose control in the sense that we don't get to dictate what our life's going to be about. He does. And you know, this is exactly what Galatians 2.20 says. The life I now live in the flesh, I live how? By faith in the Son of God. See, that's walking by faith. That's trusting the Lord every step of the way. 2 Corinthians 5, one of my, one of my favorite verses um, in the Bible. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 15. For the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. Verse 15, and he died for all that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. See, the life that we live in the flesh is no longer I, but Christ. That's the goal of the Christian life, is to live in such a way that we're living for the one who died for us and rose again. Why would we want to live any other way? Why would we want to live dictating how we are going to live, what we are going to do, what we're not going to do, right? 
And, and so many times that's exactly the mindset of how we approach life. Well, I would never go there, Lord. Or I, I, I'll go there, but I'm not going to go there. Really? Are you kidding me? Who's in charge? <laughs> Who's in control? And, and see, when we present our bodies as a sacrifice, what we're saying, the mental imagery, is that we're saying, Lord, I'm yours. What do you want, Lord? What do you want to accomplish, Lord? Yeah, I want the lawn chair. I want the sweet tea. I want easy circumstances. But more than I want that, I want you. I want your will. I want what you want to do. And so this is the idea communicated here in this presentation of our bodies as a sacrifice. And you know what's also awesome about this is that once we realize this, there is no pressure on you to perform because now you've entrusted him to do what he wants to do in and through you. And guess what? You can actually enjoy the Christian life. You can actually enjoy Jesus Christ and you can stop putting all this pressure on yourself to perform for everybody else out there and you can concern yourself with the, with the one who, who really matters cares about. You can concern yourself with only what he cares about. See, it takes the pressure off. It takes the pressure off. It, it puts the joy back in life. You're, you're not just, you know, you're not all cranked up, you know, like, you know, I, I, my grandmother used to say, don't get your underwear in a bundle, you know? And, and I tell you, man, we, sometimes we live the Christian life with our underwear in a bundle. We're, so, we're cranked so tight, trying to please everybody and anybody, legalistically going about the Christian life instead of presenting ourselves to the Lord. There's no pressure there. You can rely upon him. Jesus says, come to me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. You know, that, was, that whole picture of yoke was they would put a stronger ox with a weaker ox, and the stronger ox bore the weight. Don't you want to live life with Jesus Christ bearing the weight? You get to go along for the ride? Man, that's, that's awesome. That would be an awesome, joy-filled, precious life. In fact, that's why we see in, in Psalm, in this case of fellowship with the Lord, that in his presence there's fullness of joy, and at his right hand there are pleasures forevermore. That's the kind of life we're talking about, abundant life. And it's right here available for us uh, as we present our bodies as living sacrifices. In fact, he goes on to describe this sacrifice in three ways. Um, what's interesting about this verse is uh, those of us that have quoted it and, and memorized it before, we typically quote it as a living sacrifice. But what's, what's really interesting about this verse is there's actually three adjectives describing the sacrifice, and they're all equal with one another. Sometimes we separate living out from among the other two, but they're actually all equal. There's three adjectives here. You can see it in verse one. The first one is living that we're all familiar with, but the other two are holy and acceptable. Those are also adjectives describing the type of sacrifice that we're called to uh, present here. So the word living. Well, a couple things we learn about the word living, it's in contrast with the dead sacrifices that were made in the Old Testament. Nobody ever presented a living sacrifice in the Old Testament. In fact, they killed the animal before they put it on the altar. This is different in that way. This is describing a living sacrifice. And so it's very clear that God still wants to use our bodies in our time on earth, that God, according to Ephesians 2.10, has good works that he's designed for you, dear believer, to walk in. That's, that's what he wants to accomplish here. And he wants to accomplish that in and through you. And so how do, we, how do we know what those are unless we're walking by faith presented to the Lord? We don't. We're just taking a stab at all sorts of good works that exist out there, but we don't really know if we're walking in the good works that he wants us to unless we're presented to him by faith. That's, that's the mindset that we're looking at here. It also ties us back to Romans 6 because if you're presenting yourself as a living sacrifice, you're presenting your bodies as one who is alive from the dead. In other words, you're resting on the work that Jesus has done to free you from sin's power and your co-crucifixion and co-resurrection with him. So we're talking about resurrection life here. The second description is the word holy. And, and the, the word holy can, can have a moral quality to it, but it also means set apart. It also means distinct, distinctly presented to the Lord. You're set apart. The idea is that I'm set apart to the Lord, so I'm not going to set myself apart to sin. I'm going to set myself apart to the Lord for his distinct, unique use. That's the idea communicated with holy. And then acceptable to God, meaning well-pleasing to him. And here's what you've got to understand. God is assuring each one of us in this passage that if you have a body you can live a life pleasing to the Lord. It doesn't matter what shape your body is in. 
If you have a body, you can present it in such a way and do so in a such a way that's acceptable and pleasing to the Lord. That should provide each one of us with great encouragement. So if you want to please the Lord, if you want to bear fruit in every good work, and you generally want to be well-pleasing to him in all that you do, you must live your life presenting your body to him as a living, holy, and acceptable sacrifice. And you must not go on presenting your body to the sin nature. This is the whole key of this verse. And in fact, this ought to be in our thinking, flashing in our thinking on a moment by moment, daily basis in our Christian life. Not just right now when we're going through Romans 12, 1, but moment by moment in our thinking, in our daily Christian life, this is the way we ought to be thinking. This is a walk of faith. We're presenting our bodies to the Lord by faith based on the work that he accomplished for us. Now, why is this so important? Well, I've kind of talked about that, but let's, let's keep looking in the verse. Why is Paul so intense about this? Like, what is the reason that, that he details here? Well, as we look at that last phrase in our passage, we see this. He says that you present your body as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, this last phrase, which is your reasonable service. See, presenting your bodies is reasonable. Presenting your bodies makes sense. Based on what God has done for you, this is the only thing that makes sense. This is very logical. This is very rational. This is what God wants to accomplish in and through you. And so reasonable means something pertaining to reason. And so as it relates to, uh, to service, it could be understood, understood that as uh, service to God, which implies intelligent meditation or reflection. Again, that we're not just serving to serve, we're serving based on what he's done for us. There's a, there's a direct tie back to the mercies of God, what he's accomplished for us on our behalf. So it's not some emotional high or ecstatic experience. You know, some people say, well, I, I, just, I just wasn't feeling it, so I just didn't serve. It's not about what you feel. <laughs> Which, in fact, many times the, the, the feelings kind of uh, should trail uh, many times uh, truth and faith. But the point is this, not what you feel, are you presented? Not, not if you feel it, if you're feeling it, that's not, that's, that's just so uh, unimportant in, in terms of why to do things. It is based on the truth and based on the mercies of God, are you presenting your bodies as a living sacrifice? It's not some emotional higher experience. This is your reasonable, this makes sense. This is our reasonable response. And so what we learn here is that walking by faith is reasonable. It's logical. It's based on objective truth. And see, we're depending upon objective truth concerning a real person. That's why when people say, well, walking by faith is like closing your eyes and stepping off a, a boulder. That, I don't know what kind of faith that is. That's not biblical faith. Biblical faith always rests on an object. Always rests on an object that you know. Now, it doesn't mean that you, you can see every step, but you know the object underneath you that holds you. He's a person. His name's Jesus Christ. There's objective truth about what that person did and accomplished, and that's what we're walking by faith. And see, that's reasonable. That's logical. That's rational. We can, we can touch it. We can feel it. It happened in history. It's objective. It's not just how we feel about it. It's the way that it is. So again, we're not presenting our bodies in a heightened state of frenzied activity, like, hey, if you want to serve the Lord, come up front. I mean, that's not what we're talking about at all. We're not talking about those events. We're talking about a moment-by-moment, -moment, stable, rational, resting upon objective truth in our daily life um, in whatever situation we find ourselves in. Do you know that you can be spiritual washing the dishes at home? And sometimes we think the only thing spiritual is like when we get up on the stage at church and do something. That's not, that, you could do that carnally. You could, you could be completely out of fellowship with the Lord and be on stage at church. We, we need to shift our thinking. This is presenting our bodies in whatever we find ourselves in. Washing dishes, changing diapers. I used to think about that when I used to change diapers. I can be spiritual right here in this moment. And that's tough because you're cleaning up some pretty wild stuff once in a while. But in that moment, in fellowship with the Lord, relying upon him, enjoying Jesus Christ, I can be spiritual while I'm wiping a, ba a baby's bottom. Isn't that incredible? And that's what we're talking about here. It's not some frenzied activity. 
we're considering the truths, we're reckoning on those truths regarding the mercies of God, and it's reasonable, it makes sense. This is the reasonable response. In fact, why would we not present our bodies to the one who died for us and rose again? Why would we not present our bodies to the one who did it all for us? Why would we not? It doesn't make sense. Of course we would. In fact, if we won't do it for him, who will we do it for? If we can't present our bodies to the one who died for us, who can we present our bodies to? And for many of us, the answer is we present ourselves to sin. We, we take the sin nature over the Lord Jesus Christ. And may that never be said of us consistently. One final thing, and, and we'll close. Paul uses a unique word translated service here. It's, it's, an, it's a very unique word. Paul uses it a lot. But it, described a speci- it could describe service in general, but it also could describe a very specific service used in the Jewish temple. It was a priestly service. Um, this word was used there um, of those in the Jewish temple. And so he used it um, often, and it's unique because this word service is also a synonym for worship. And I just, I just put that out to you. Have you ever viewed service to God as worship of God? And see, he, he uses this word because he ties those two things together. And so this morning as we close, I um, beseech you and I beseech me the same way Paul did with an urgency and a heartfelt desire and passion to present your bodies as one who is alive from the dead. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you died with Christ to sin You've been raised to newness of life, and now you want to present your bodies moment by moment, actively choosing by faith to present your bodies to the Lord for his good pleasure and his use. Let's close with a word of prayer. Lord, thank you um, for your word and just this incredible truth that we find here in Romans 12.1. Uh, Lord, we know that um, the way life goes, we'll, we'll forget about this even by the time we pull out of the parking lot. So we need you to graciously remind us and, and remember, uh, cause our minds to remember um, these truths so that we might rely upon them in our daily life and begin to benefit um, from all the things that you've put in place um, to, to give us a life where we're delivered from the power of sin and we can enjoy fellowship with you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.